Ian will, will get into a lot more detail. Uh, please welcome uh, Ian Willis to the stand. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, delegates. Uh, thanks very much to Kerry and the organisers for uh, inviting me to present this uh, to keynote this afternoon. It's always a great pleasure to be back in Broken Hill, uh, which is where I learned pretty much the, the basics of my trade as a geologist. Firstly, with the Geological Survey Mapping Team, which was here for quite a period of time, and then as a, an explorationist with Aberfoyle Resources um, back in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. So I worked here for a period a total of about 13 years, which makes me a, a sea grouper, um, of which I'm very proud. And I have a daughter who actually was born here. She's an A grouper. So we have a very uh, close attachment then to, um, to, to Broken Hill. Interestingly, Anglo-American is, I think, the only major uh, present here at this conference, presenting in particular, which I think is rather interesting. Um, it's interesting to see that our peer groups absent, actually absent, because in many ways I think um, Broken Hill is the, as one of the, the birthplaces of mining and mining history in Australia, has a very, very real place in, in uh, mining, the mining history of, of both the country and also globally. So I find it a bit odd that the uh, peers are not here. But having said that, Anglo is very pleased to be here and very pleased to be able to support the conference. Australia enjoys high ratings as a resource industry investment destination. This reputation uh, is built on an enviable prospectivity combined with an open investment regime and very low country risk. Exploration has played a pivotal role in developing that uh, reputation in Australia with many significant discoveries in the past decades and those discoveries have underpinned both uh, resource investment in this country and also national development. In this talk, I'd like to take a closer look at what are some of the issues surrounding uh, current in, uh, currently influencing risk and opportunity in this country. And I'm going to take a perspective of a multinational major diversified mining company, which I also think translates into generally into the international mining, mining business. It's a pretty high level viewpoint uh, not a lot of time to go into detail, and I'm going to focus very much on thinking around the top 5 to 10 per cent of ore deposit discoveries, those that are known as the Tier 1 deposits and the ones that deliver most of the value in our industry. Oh, we've got a disclaimer, how surprising. If you can read that, good luck to you. Um, uh, it is on our website, but uh, there is a disclaimer. Most of what I'm going to say today will not drive you out to um, buy shares in Anglo-American, but uh, nevertheless, there it is. But what we are going to talk about, the company, uh, interestingly enough, not a lot of people know a lot about Anglo-American, so I want to talk about that a little bit. Exploration within Anglo-American, what are some of the key risks in a general sense in, in international global exploration? And I want to posit uh, two views to you of, of how Australia is perceived in the industry. Uh, how Anglo-American uh, has approached risk and opportunity in this country and then draw some fairly broad conclusions from all of that. Who are we? Well, uh, Anglo-American is not anglo gold shanty. Can we just get that off the agenda straight away? We used to own up to 50, 60 per cent or so of Anglo-Gold, um, but we divested three or four years ago. They're an entirely separate uh, organisation. So when we talk about Anglo in this room, please, it's Anglo-American. We're a bit sensitive about that. London listed, global diversified mining company, fifth largest or sixth largest, depending on how you measure, uh, by market cap at about 60, 60 billion or thereabouts. And, and as our chairman mentioned, we've got a strong focus on a core set of commodities, platinum and diamonds, in which we are world leaders. Uh, the base metals, copper and nickel, having sold out of our zinc assets uh, last year. And um, a building in a business in iron ore, which is uh, in, in, through Brazil and also in, uh, in South Africa, and a strong presence in both MET uh, coal and thermal coal. Our revenues, 32 billion roughly in 2010, so a pretty substantial uh, organisation. Some of the uh, financial indicators there for you are profit, operating profit of about 10 billion last year, a very substantial sum and uh, very much uh, a relief after the GFC of, of the year before. Uh, capital expenditure is fairly robust at about 5 billion, 
and uh, continuing, we are continuing, continuing to invest into our business as time goes by. We are a global company, uh, as you can see from this slide, North America, South America, um, Africa and, uh, and Australia. Uh, um, uh, very much our focus is, is on South America, as you can see there, Brazil and Chile, but also uh, very much in South Africa, which of course is pretty much the heritage of the company. Uh, we do have our uh, platinum, coal and other operations in, in South Africa. What you mightn't realise is that Anglo Coal uh, Australia, which is now our met metallurgical coal business unit, operates out of Brisbane with some very substantial assets in Queensland, the Bowen Basin and also New South Wales. That's a fairly hefty business and our main business in Australia. And also that we own 40% of, uh, of uh, the uh, manganese operations, Groot Island, Bell Bay, in partnership with, um, with BHP and through a small company called Samancor. So we have a presence, an operating presence in Australia, which may not be all that apparent to everybody. Uh, and we also operate a, an exploration office out of, uh, out of Perth, which I'll talk about now. Uh, so an operational uh, spread, but also in terms of exploration, a worldwide footprint. As you can see there, uh, we operate in about 12 to 13 countries. It does vary from time to time. North America, South America, Southern Africa, and in the Asia-Pacific region. In, uh, in this region, uh, we have a, a hub uh, office in Perth, which uh, takes care of exploration in the Asia-Pacific region, and also is the uh, home base for our Australian exploration team. Uh, projects in Indonesia and Australia. Uh, we have worked in the Philippines where we have an operating base, um, but we no longer um, have projects in that country. And we keep a pretty good watching brief on, on um, the resources sector throughout the Asia Pacific region on behalf of Anglo. Our exploration group has had a pretty enviable uh, track, track record of discovery the past decade or 15 years or so. Um, uh, a couple of things I'd like to mention off this rather busy slide. Uh, first of all, uh, down the bottom uh, right-hand corner there, you'll see Los Salfatos, the discovery uh, we made uh, recently in Chile, announced last year, uh, which was a very great success, uh, 1.2 billion tonne declared res resource at this point in time at about 1.5% copper. Uh, that will be one of the world's great mines, uh, an adjunct to our Los Bronces. Um, a deposit in, in Chile, um, which is a, a very major operation for us. Another one I'd like to mention is the top right-hand corner, the green uh, oval there, Sakati, in Finland, a recent discovery of ours, a, a very interesting uh, copper-nickel uh, PGE discovery uh, in, in the uh, Fenno-Scandian shield there. Sakati is being drilled out as we speak and it's a very interesting deposit. Uh, but there's one more deposit on there I'd really like to mention to you, and that's the, uh, the Humsburg East from South, South Australia, the Humsburg East uh, zinc deposit mentioned there. Um, that's a Broken Hill type deposit, and uh, I have to say I was very pleased to be involved in the discovery of that deposit uh, in, in 2005, um, taking the skills that I learned here in Broken Hill, applying them to uh, some of the, uh, the Proterozoic rocks in South Africa and resulting in a discovery there. Very pleasing indeed. So we've got a pretty good track record of discovery and uh, I'd have to say that the, the um, I guess that suggests that we've got a pretty fair understanding of at least the technical risks around our business. If you can have multi-commodity discoveries in multiple countries uh, around the world, you must be doing something reasonably well in terms of handling many of the uh, major risks that affect your business. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. What are they? Uh, annually, or perhaps biannually if we're a bit lazy, but uh, generally annually, we, uh, we do a risk assessment of what are the main risks that are affecting us in our business. Now, I would imagine most companies do this, perhaps it's back of the envelope, but we take pretty seriously, got a very formal process uh, which is applied um, throughout the business looking at what the key risks are and how we're going to mitigate them for the period coming forward and what are the new risks that need to be assessed. Um, on this list of, this is the latest list, it's the top nine uh, risk, key risks that we've identified. In fact, we only finished this a few months back in, in Colombia. And no, no surprises in any of this, but it's interesting to see that there is a list and that we do take these, these issues very seriously in, in our business. Safety, uh, top of the list always, um, safety of our employees and contractors, and it's a bit of a mantra in, in, in Anglo-American. 
uh, to take that on as a key risk to be managed properly and well. But the second one down there, technical risk, is probably the one that challenges, most challenges explorationists. Are we in the right place? Do we have the right models? Are we using the right tools? Are we making the right decisions? Do we have the capability? That's the one that almost always drives the thinking and the methodology in exploration. It's a very, very serious business. If we are in the wrong places and doing the wrong things, we're never going to find the deposits we're after. We have to do that right. Community and our licence to operate. In my career, I've seen community become far, far more uh, directly in line with, with in our faces, and rightly so. In the past, we have tended to perhaps not to take community as seriously as we needed to. Uh, and there's no doubt about it, we put a huge effort now into community relations and, and our licence to operate. Political and financial risks, uh, once again, this is a set of issues that are very typical, very, very common. Um, always things we have to take into account, commonly things we can't actually necessarily direct or manage. One of the risks which is really taking us by surprise over the last five years or so is people and talent. Who's with us? Who can we get to do the job? Uh, are, the talent and, and are the talent and people available? Um, that's a pretty serious risk to us and looking forward we're doing an awful lot of work trying to make sure um, that we're getting the right people into our, job, into our projects. Uh, one thing which came out of left field with us was we thought we were pretty good at project management. We discovered the world has moved on and we've put a lot of effort in the last couple of years into improving our discipline around project management. Surprising for a company like Anglo, but there you are. Security. You're working in DRC, you're working in Colombia, you're working in Indonesia or Philippines. Uh, security becomes very much front and foremost in your thoughts. So a lot of effort into security and ensuring that our people are going to be safe. And the last two there, the, uh, the um, uh, risks eight and nine, tenure always uh, has to be done properly and of course legal risks, agreements and contracts, always pretty high risk part of, of our business. So just looking at those, uh, those issues there, um, no surprises and our peers would have pretty much exactly the same list, they may have a few, few others in there, but uh, those are the key risks that we see and, and work with. How do we manage those risks? We use a process around global risk and portfolio management. Um, we're looking at three particular areas in this, and these are processes and methods that we apply quite strictly. Firstly, in terms of prospectivity and managing where are we working in the right place, we use a philosophy called the key mineral belts philosophy or process. Identifying key mineral belts globally based on new science, new ideas, R&D, uh, endowment, diagnostic criteria and we classify them into established, emerging and frontier and on that basis we allocate capital to their exploration. In terms of uh, once we've decided to get into a belt, um, the next application is, is that of country risk. Uh, some oh, about 10 or 15 years ago, 10, 12 years ago we developed with uh, um, James Otto out of Canada, a uh, pretty sophisticated but basic if you know what I mean, very useful tool to assess uh, the country risk um, for a range of countries. We do 93 of them now. I'm not sure why we do so many. Uh, looking at how change happens in, in risk, country risk around the world. One of the most important things for us is the inflection point. When does risk, particularly country and sovereign risk or prospectivity, technical risk change in a particular country? And we observe and keep a close eye on that using technical, socio-political and commercial filters and that's always been a pretty key tool in our armoury and on that basis Australia ranks pretty highly both on technical and also on country risk issues. And once we're in business, once we're into a country, commodity reviews annually plus toll gate processes and um, <clears throat> I guess greater discipline now around our operating standards, uh, ranking mineral belts, advanced projects and opportunities, uh, we review the uh, exploration portfolio annually, identify new exploration initiatives, particularly from things like dormant deposits and so on. Um, and then, of course, the usual but sometimes forgotten about disciplines around safety community, project management standards, etc. So it's, uh, those, di those maps on the side there are not meant to be read by you, but um, they're there to illustrate the, 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 uh, the, uh, the global reach when we do these processes and, and how, how they translate into, um, into uh, our projects and how we operate. Okay, um, I said I'd posit two views, industry views of, of Australia. 
Uh, Anglo is a global company. Uh, everything, the, the decisions, most of the decisions for our company in terms of investment into exploration uh, emanate from the regions and, and are made in, in London. And I'd have to say that in discussions with my peers and also within our company, that generally there appear to be two viewpoints on Australia. The glass half empty view, Australia is exploration mature, perhaps, to, perhaps it's a country to avoid and go elsewhere to explore. Then there's the glass half full viewpoint, which is no, as, uh, on the contrary, there are significant opportunities remain in this country. Uh, there are competitive advantages to leverage. Let's make, take advantage of those and go for it. Perspectives, perspectives and perceptions actually matter. So how the country is viewed, whether it's a glass half full or a glass half empty, whether it's beer or milk, is always important in those who make the decisions. Glass half empty, proceed with caution. Some of the key matters that are raised here. Mature exploration setting, what does that actually mean? Well, in general, uh, the feedback I get is that, well, all the key mineral belts are known and they've all been tested. Mm, perhaps. All outcrop areas have been tested. There's no outcropping Tier 1 deposits left in Australia. Most accessible Tier 1 deposits, that is, those in shallow cover or outcrop, have been found. And the, the general argument is there's no opportunity now for first mover advantage in, in Australia. Also, competition, very intense here with a very robust, thankfully, uh, junior sector. So it's not always easy to acquire or access opportunities. Uh, the high cost structure and lastly, regulatory and financial pressures. This last one I'm not going to talk a huge amount about, um, but uh, we're all aware of what some of those pressures are. On the other hand, the glass half full. Well, looking at opportunities here, Australia has very good potential for new discoveries. Uh, this is a view that says that uh, anything under, say, well, let's say I hear 100, 150, 200 metres uh, depth that undercover or uh, hasn't actually been explored in Australia. And, I, and I, I, I can understand that viewpoint. New tools in old areas bring new discoveries. New ideas in old areas also bring new discoveries. The best available geoscience data sets and data accessibility. Until you've worked in DRC or... Uh, Burundi or uh, Mozambique, you don't understand how important it is in Australia to have such a fantastic infrastructure of data, and it's here on the, at your fingertips. World-class geoscience and mining R&D. I think it's very important to realise that we are in the forefront of mining and also exploration R&D. Efficiency and capability, having an extensive service industry to help us uh, make the best of our projects is also pretty critical. Quality people. As somebody, one of the speakers said yesterday, you want to do a job, get an Australian to do it. Capacity and ability. It's really important to have the right people doing the job. Um, we do have a mining and exploration culture. Even in uh, Melbourne and Sydney, uh, the, 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 uh, the industry has a higher profile. More people understand how important this business is to the country's wealth uh, than before. And also, I think very importantly, because the resources sector in Australia is highly adaptive, uh, that leads to innovation, new ideas and new discoveries. So these two ideas, these two possibilities, these two positions um, rattle through the, the minds of uh, those who make uh, investment decisions in our industry out of London, uh, Sao Paulo and, and uh, Toronto. And um, how do we tackle it? Anglo-American, how do, how do we look at these things? Well, as, as I've already um, put to you, we use a very disciplined approach looking at the commodity, country, key belts, project assessment plus ranking processes. We, we measure Australia against the rest of the world. Are the belts there? Are the possibilities there? And using that sort of a process, Australia is very favourable to Anglo-American for, in our current assessments, nickel, iron ore and coal. And we do know of a number of other commodities that we're interested in that don't necessarily rate on that scale at this point in time. We know there's a potential for deep cover and, and deep and undercover deposits. And the reason we know that is we've developed a series of tools and um, uh, using a series of proprietary tools that can help us to explore both undercover and, and, uh, and at depth. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. We are quite happy to leverage uh, opportunities with partners, very pleased to invest into, into core R&D around the world, 
And in that score, I'd have to say that in Australia we spend a fair bit of money on uh, pure and, uh, and applied geoscience and exploration R&D. And in terms of the risk on people and talent, it's interesting to see how we, we do access an awful lot of people from Australia. Those people are across the disciplines uh, working for Anglo around the world. But when it's necessary, we find it quite uh, rewarding to bring in people from other parts of the world. And with a global talent pool, um, we are generally able to, um, to meet our res resource needs in terms of people. I'd like to give you an example of how we've tackled this. Um, the, uh, at the moment, uh, um, our main focus in Australia is the Musgraves uh, Nickel Copper PGE belt in um, Western Australia and across into, into South Australia, uh, the northwestern parts of South Australia. Um, the, we're operating there in a fairly major project, spending around about uh, $3 million, $4 million, $5 million a year. The process that, why we're in there, Musgraves was identified as one of the, world, the global key mineral belts five, ten years ago in part of our reviews. But at that stage, very difficult competitive pressures to get in there were too high, and also um, uh, relationships with the Aboriginal people there were not great, so uh, we avoided it. However, the global financial crisis presented us with the opportunity to take a significant strategic position in that belt. And through partnerships with a number of companies, in particular with Tracker Resources, uh, we've managed to secure a very a strategic foothold, about 7,000 square kilometres in that belt. Um, we managed to, in, in, uh, to uh, uh, engage the community in, in a much better framework and uh, we're very pleased with our relationships with the Aboriginal people there now. Uh, applied our uh, proprietary tools with first pass screening with Spectrum and our low temperature squid ground EM, so proprietary uh, 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 tools for, for deep and undercover exploration. We applied some pretty interesting general and uh, from our experience elsewhere in the world and then specific R&D to some of the deposit styles, tight cost management, safe work practices and then strong London support. And within a matter of weeks, we'd secured the joint venture and were uh, planning for that work. And it's now in its third year, uh, several drilling campaigns later. We, this is how um, the assessment of the, the, the process of assessing risk in a country and then at a project level can be carried out very quickly and very appropriately. We're very pleased with how this has worked out. Um, and it's a great project that we're moving forward on. So some conclusions. Um, I think it's fair to say that despite all the good things, Australia is still a very challenging exploration environment. But there's no question, no question whatsoever, it has some really good competitive advantages. First of all, most of the key risks in the list that I presented to you in this country are manageable. In many countries, they're not manageable. Uh, but I can say with, well, with difficulty, they're manageable. Certainly in Australia, most of the key risks are relatively manageable. I think also it's very important to remember the, the value and quality of the data sets and the research and development outcomes that are available to us. Uh, sometimes we forget how just, we just go and get a mag image. We've got a tremendous data infrastructure here which, which, which we can leverage. And, and my view is, and the view I sell to London is, if you want to drive new concepts and new discoveries, Australia is a fabulous laboratory. With all the data and information you could, you could wish for, uh, take that information, leverage it and, and push it hard. Um, cost pressures, though, are an issue and the, uh, the rising Australian dollar continues to be a, a risk which we find rather difficult to manage. Uh, costs even in Australian dollars are rising, as everybody is fully aware. It's not a simple thing um, to be running major exploration programs uh, in this country uh, on a US dollar budget. Um, at this point in time. However, cost management is essential and um, it does make Australia somewhat of a less attractive environment, but on the other hand, um, managing costs is always something we have to do. And lastly, uh, I'd like to make a point about availability of skills and people. Um, uh, yesterday there were a number of speakers who spoke about uh, this as being a, a real challenge to the country and, and also to our industry. I tend to agree with them, but it's interesting to see how we manage to attract uh, some very, very good people on a global basis into our company who are now working in this country, in Australia, and how we've managed to move 
very good people from Australia to other parts of the world to help us fill gaps and capacity and capability there as well. It's a global business now, and I know it's very difficult for junior companies to access the global talent market, but they, those people are out there, and we've been extremely successful through a number of programs at, at actually uh, pulling people in, very, very good people, into our, into our teams and into our exploration um, programs. Um, so global talent sourcing is where it's at in my view. If we can't get the people in Australia, then we will look for them overseas and we'll always be looking to develop our Australian, uh, young Australian people as well to make them the, the leaders and discoverers of the future. Having said that, there's no question that we do need to invest a lot of effort and, and attention into developing um, the resource uh, skilling and uh, people base in this country. And that's all I have for you. Um, you can make up your own mind as to whether we're seeing the sunset or the sunrise on, on our industry. Um, but having, uh, I, I, having seen that there are two particular viewpoints around the, the risks inherent in, in exploration in, in Australia, the glass half full, glass half empty viewpoint, viewpoints, uh, all I can say is that they have to be balanced. There are issues on both sides of the equation, but uh, I think um, being an Australian and having explored here, my view is that the, certainly the glass half full viewpoint is the more practical and pragmatic one. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ian. In order to give all our presenters uh, their allotted 10 minutes, we may come back to, to questions at the end if we have time. Um, just uh, another reminder that the, uh, the Sorrent's Persuasive Pitches for Active Entrepreneurs Workshop is about to start upstairs. Uh, attendance is limited, so please visit the registration desk to collect your free ticket. Yes, I did say free. Um, our next speaker is uh, Greg Starr, Executive Chairman of Gold Anomaly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, seeing the presentation today, and thank you very much to the symposium for inviting us here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the drilling at Gold Anomaly for a world-class gold discovery in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the usual disclaimer, uh, I'll quickly go through the company. We are a typical junior. Uh, we've got a lot of shares out there at the moment. Uh, you'll see there in the far right-hand side in March 2011 of the graph, there's been a significant movement recently as a result of uh, drill results that we've recently released, um, and the market has uh, certainly got excited by that. Uh, but I'll go through that, though, drilling on our Crater Mountain project, which is going to be the focus of my presentation today. All right, uh, just a bit of a snapshot. We are in Papua New Guinea. We're in the eastern highlands section of Papua New Guinea. Uh, and as other speakers have said earlier, uh, Papua New Guinea is certainly a, a place for multinational investment and uh, is seen very positive by the, by the uh, mining community. Uh, the Crater Mountain project in particular is a former BHP Tier 1 asset. Uh, it has had historical drilling by Triple Plate Junction, MacMin, SOBHP, uh, up until about 2007. That was what we regarded as a first generation of exploration. Since 2000 and, uh, 2009, on the merger of uh, Gold Aura and Anomaly Resources, uh, Gold Anomaly was formed and has undertaken the second uh, phase of exploration. What we have known from the exploration so far is that it's a similar geological setting to a couple of other large PNG deposits, namely Porgra, Wafi, uh, and Hidden Valley. Uh, and we certainly see from the drilling results, which I'll go through the, with you, that there's a significant potential for a, a, uh, a world-class project. One of the key features that we have, which is, I guess stands out from other juniors, is that we have uh, one of the most successful exploration prospectors in Papua New Guinea is uh, leading the charge in, in uh, exploration. Uh, Peter has been involved with many of the key uh, projects in Papua New Guinea, namely uh, Lahir, Frida River, Wafi, uh, Misma, Simbiri. He's had, I think some estimates are of 100 million ounces of, uh, uh, of exploration success, and now we're looking at Crater Mountain. And you know, we're certainly expecting that we'll get between one and five million ounces there, and I'll, I'll go through some of that a little later. In terms of where Crater Mountain is, we are in the Eastern Highlands. As you can see, uh, there are some nine world-class gold resources, greater than five million ounces each, in the region that we're in. Wafi, Porgra, Hidden Valley, 
Um, and as many of you know, it's a, it's a wonderful area uh, where, uh, in fact, I don't think anywhere in the world in such a small area you'll get such uh, exciting and large exploration successes. Uh, the first slide I showed you was uh, uh, ounces or large projects which, uh, projects which are greater than five million ounces. The second slide here is the same slide which has the average grade of those ounces and you can see many of them are, are low grade deposits um, between one and, and, five ounce, and five grams a tonne. Uh, this slide here just indicating where we are and in relation to uh, the project itself. Uh, we have three leases uh, with an area which is some 300 square kilometres. We're about, to, you fly from Port Moresby up to Garoka and you can get a, uh, well you can drive down if you want to, but you can get a helicopter from Garoka to the, uh, to the project in about half an hour or so. So easily accessible uh, with the road access and now benching and road all the way around the project, you've got good logistical access to the project as well. We have, uh, as I say, over 300 square kilometres of area that we're, that is in part of our tenements. However, I'm going to talk about the Navera area, which is uh, 10 square kilometres or so, of which we've probably got a footprint in our exploration of maybe a kilometre, square kilometre or so. So a very small area I'm going to talk about of a very large area of exploration. And here we are again with, uh, in red there, in the red dots, are areas of anomalous uh, gold geochemistry. Uh, in the centre at the top is uh, the, the red dot in the centre at the top is in the Vera Prospect and on the right hand side at the top there you'll see kind of black thatched which is a small area that we're starting to explore uh, at the moment. Uh, in terms of the mineralisation model, uh, what you're seeing there is uh, on the right hand side of the, the kind of oval shape there is uh, what we're seeing is what we regard as a mixing zone and this is an area uh, down at the moment, we've drilled, we've identified down about 400 metres uh, deep. It's probably reasonably barren near the surface. This is the right-hand side of the diagram there. Uh, pretty, pretty barren for the first 150-odd metres or so. But then we've got these very large uh, uh, intercepts that we've had, 200 metres at, at uh, uh, well, 215 metres at 1.46 was our most recent hole. Uh, the earlier hole was... Uh, 286 metres at, 0 .8, at 0 0.86. So these large intersections uh, that we're exploring at the moment. Now, with a bit of history, there was a bit of history is that uh, with MacMin uh, BHP and Triple Plate Junction, in fact, put 16 holes on this for some 4,000 metres in that first generation of drilling. So we, we knew that we, where we were going. Uh, the beauty is, and why our share price and the market has taken uh, a likeness to it, is that the first two holes that we've put in uh, which have been in a different direction, which I'll show a little later, uh, have been successful. And certainly from what we're seeing so far is given it's that WAFI style, uh, we now need to start drilling deeper. And that's the, uh, what's going to be behind our second phase of drilling, which will be commencing over the next uh, couple of months or so. On the left-hand side at the top there, you'll see uh, the other uh, oval shape is what we're regarding at the moment. It's maybe super gene rich uh, area, some 200 metres wide to 300 metres wide. We've put two holes in that recently. Uh, we're only down to 200 metres uh, and the assays for that will be out shortly. Uh, however, uh, certainly there's enough excitement there to, to uh, uh, identify we need to continue drilling. Now, just, uh, well, this, is, this slide here just gives an idea. In the purple area there, which is what we're calling our main zone, uh, which is about as I say, about 600 metres wide or so. Uh, we've got two holes in there, NEV 19 and NEV 18. That was this current generation of drilling that we've put in. Uh, they're the ones that were, as, as I say, 200 metres odd, 0.86 and 1.46. So uh, really interesting. The next hole, we've now completed six hole. The third hole that we're waiting for assays on, NEV 20, which is in the green at the top, uh, 21, 22 and 23. Uh, They'll be coming out over the next few weeks and you'll see ongoing results coming from the Crater Mountain drilling uh, between now and probably the early July. Why do we think there's a, a multi-million ounce deposit? Well, we, uh, in the small area that we've drilled so far, uh, if you just do an estimate of 150 metres on surface by 600 metres or so and just go down 150 metres uh, at a gram, which is well within what, what we expect, you'll come up with over a million ounces. It's open to depth, it's open long strike. Um, 
we certainly think that there's uh, a great possibility for you know, a significant gold deposit there. In terms of the mineralisation model, uh, it is an intrusion-related low sulphidation epithermal gold deposit, similar to what you see at Pogra, Wafi Link Zone, Hidden Valley uh, and Missima. And we're seeing the, seeing the same type of uh, mineralisation throughout the project. Uh, I'll move, on, move along a couple of slides here just because of time. Uh, there's an indication of uh, what the topography is like, very similar to what you see at Wafi. Uh, this next slide here, the hole in the centre was NEV 18, and on the eastern side there was NEV 19. As you can see, very long, deep holes, uh, which I can go through with you with our present, in our booth, the presentation. Uh, this is just a slide showing the similarities between 18 and 19, the current generation of drilling, uh, very similar, uh, longer, deeper, higher grade between 18 and, and 19. Uh, the results are indicating that we need to move forward now to a 10,000 metre program, which uh, we expect to start in uh, uh, April, in uh, July, August or so. Uh, and there's a diagram there showing similarities between NEV 2 through to NEV 17, all long, deep, uh, uh, low grade, but uh, highly prospective uh, drilling. One of the things that Peter has indicated is that while the potential of deeper feeder zones has been postulated, uh, there's evidence of advancement to, uh, we need to investigate the, the a area at depth, uh, probably down to 1,000 metres or so. As I say, we've got in the first half and the second half of, the, of, uh, next, of this year, we'll uh, be getting results out from the final four holes, continually bringing information to the market. Uh, we are starting a, a project in Brazil at the moment, which is commence production and that uh, you should see cash flow generating from that over the next few months or so, but the focus is on our Crater Mountain project. So in summary, we have a potential world-class project at Crater Mountain, very, very active exploration program run by a, a person that's had significant success in the area, and uh, we expect to see uh, San Chico Drew generate cash flow in the next uh, month or so. Thanks very much. Thank you, Greg. Our next speaker is Bruce Griffin, Chief Executive Officer of MIL Resources. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for your time. Uh, I'll continue the, uh, the PNG thing uh, and explain a bit about mill resources. Uh, like everyone else, first of all, uh, obligatory disclaimer. Um, mill Resources uh, is an ASX listed PNG focused copper gold exploration company. Um, we've got a, a large land position in, in PNG. Um, we, we own eight 100% owned uh, copper gold projects um, spread uh, across from the, the southeastern tip of the main uh, part of PNG up through New Britain and a range of projects across New Ireland. Um, they cover more than 8,000 square kilometres, so we do have a lot of land to work. Um, about half of them are granted and the other half are applications we're awaiting uh, approval on. The, the other project we have in PNG is, uh, is uh, Amazon Bay, which is in the, in the south. It's a um, vanadium-rich titanomagnetite project um, that we're, uh, we're working on that as well. Our uh, flagship project is a project called POI. It's uh, located about 270 kilometres southwest of Port Moresby, and it is on the, the main faulting structures of the PNG mainland and is coincident with a transfer uh, structure which um, Greg Corbin and a number of others identified that this is a, a, a classic setting for the large deposits that have been discovered in PNG. Um, we, we have a, a large radiometric anomaly there and we've got good coincident uh, gl uh, anomalous gold geochemistry results. Um, I won't run through all of those but uh, probably the, the strongest of them is at, at, at Aladdin's. We have 20 metres at, uh, at, at 7 grams a tonne and at, at two other locations there we've already identified very good um, geochemistry. The, um, the project's recently been, re been reviewed by a renowned um, ge geologist uh, by the name of uh, Simon Meldrum, and we also had our uh, geophysics reinterpreted. And uh, as a base, on the basis of that review, um, it reaffirmed our views of the attractiveness of the project, but probably more importantly gave us a, a new understanding of of what the, what the deposit or potential deposit actually is. 
We've always been focused on, a, on an intrusive body that was mapped many years ago um, by the Bureau of Mineral Resources. And that, that deposit is now, it's a pluton, it's a, a monzonite. And what we're looking at is a series of uh, secondary mineralizations, things like um, uh, diorite porphyries, uh, breccias, along the faults. And we've got marginal scarns in a number of locations, as well as potential for what, identified epithermal veins in a, in, in a few locations as well. Uh, as I said before, we've, we've had our, our, uh, our geophysics reinterpreted. Uh, the, the, the white uh, clearly outlines the, the, uh, the intrusive body uh, running through the, through the middle of, uh, of Aladdin's. It's over 11 kilometres long and one and a half kilometres wide. And what we've picked up in a number of locations, and the, the three key locations are highlighted on, on the picture there, we have good coincident high or anomalous geochemistry where there are cross-cutting faults across the main fault structures. Peter have uh, mineralisation on the, on the uh, boundaries of this intrusive body. Those three uh, key target areas, uh, as I said before, Aladdin's, Wallaby Ridge and Morty, each have quite large areas defined within them and uh, a number of different uh, forms of mineralization. As part of that review, um, a number of uh, both uh, geochemical and geophysical prospects were identified, um, up to 12 geophysical prospects and, and these five key geochemical prospects. We're focusing on three high-priority uh, drill targets, which are the A, B, C there, Wallaby Ridge, Aladdin's, and Morty. And the reason for focusing on these is these are where we have the best coincidence of both uh, geophysical and geochemical anomalies. The current work program at POI, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're mobilizing now to do a, uh, a um, narrower spaced ground magnetic program to help define the exact drill targets at those locations. We're doing a very focused geochemical sampling program, again, to help refine those targets. And we're working towards having a, doing a 3,000 metre drilling program uh, at Poi in the second half of, of this year. And that program will be done in conjunction with a program at Golden Peak, which I'll talk about next. Um, again, we're, we're in discussions with drilling contractors at present, and, and we certainly hope to have a rig operating at those projects uh, in the second half of this year. The Golden Peak project is about 40 kilometres east of Port Moresby. So by Papua New Guinea standards, the logistics uh, are pretty good, um, good accessibility to the project. Uh, we're following up here, we're following up work that was done by um, elders in the 1980s, and we've gone in and recreated and re-identified this uh, high-grade uh, veining in, in a trench there, uh, 20 metres at 7 grams a tonne, with 6 metres in the middle at 22 grams a tonne, uh, which is, as I said, re-identified that high grade that had been earlier, seen earlier. We're currently doing a program to extend the width of that or try to understand the full width of that mineralisation um, before drilling there in the second half of this year. So at minimum, we'll be drilling the, uh, the vein there, and we hope to be drilling a larger target at, uh, at um, Golden Peak as well. We have, uh, we have two leases, uh, two exploration licenses out on New Britain. Um, New Britain uh, is very prospective for uh, copper, molybdenum, gold systems. There are a number of uh, players very active in New Britain at present. Um, there's two particularly significant joint ventures, which is Copper Molly and Barrick, and uh, Octeti with Frontier. And uh, our licenses there are, are in the, the, the same part of the country and in those identified copper belts. Again, we're on ground. All the ground we have has been worked previously and uh, has anomalous gold results in it from, from previous work. And, and across these licenses in New Britain, we've had up to 50 grams a tonne in rock chip and uh, a whole series of, of, uh, of good anomalous uh, historical gold results there as well as mapped intrusive. So you know, the program there is to go in and follow up, follow up those leads. We have uh, a series of projects out on New Ireland. Um, First of which is a, is a project called Lagusalem. Um, Lagusalem's pretty much due west of Lahir. It's, uh, it's, it's actually a, a mapped, identified uh, uh, a porphyry deposit that was drilled by Swiss alumina in the 70s. They only drilled into the leach cap, um, quite shallow holes, just over 100 metres deep. And um, although they identified a quarter of a percent copper, they didn't, uh, they there were no assays done for gold and there were no deeper holes drilled. 
Um, there is gold, has been gold seen in the area, so we believe um, this is a, a pretty straightforward um, when the license is granted to go in and drill deeper holes and actually explore what's underneath the, the already mapped leached cap. Uh, Palabong is in the southern half of, uh, of the New Island mainland. Uh, basically, we have about half of the New Island mainland under these two licenses. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a significant faulting system through the middle of New Island with the Wetton faulting system, and there are a number of calderas mapped in there where there have been uh, anomalous copper and or gold results seen historically. And then the other two uh, projects out on New Island are uh, Massau and Tanger Islands. These are two islands that are on the Simberi, sort of Lahir chain, and um, both of these islands are uh, volcanic settings, uh, limestone cover. Uh, the other project we had I mentioned before, Amazon Bay, uh, we're currently earning to 51% of it. It's a very large uh, uh, iron, sand or titanomagnetite deposit, over 70 k's along the coast, about 10 kilometres deep. Um, and uh, it, it has a, a number of uh, interesting characteristics, one of the keys of which it has a relatively high vanadium concentration, and we're looking at whether there's an opportunity to, um, to actually uh, look at a vanadium product from this as well as a, a titanomagnetite. Uh, you know, I said before we're a listed company, relatively small, 11 million market cap. We did complete a capital raising in, in April. We have uh, uh, just over four and a half million in the bank, so we're funded for the drilling program for this year. So just to recap, you know, who is Mill Resources? As I said before, we're a Papua New Guinean focused copper gold explorer. We have a very large 100% owned land position for copper gold, and uh, we will be drilling in the second half of 2011. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Our next speaker is Julian Malnick in his capacity as Executive Chairman, Direct Nickel. Uh, Julian will be known to many of us in, in his other capacity as Chairman of uh, Sydney Mining Club and a joint founder of Nautilus Minerals. Julian. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, friends and colleagues, I'd like to uh, brighten your afternoon, if it's not bright enough with a story about an impending revolution in the production of nickel from nickel laterites. Uh, we've been uh, working in the garage on this for uh, about four years now. We haven't said very much publicly about the chemistry of our process, and I'd like to uh, uh, reveal that for you today, which is that it is a, um, a chemistry driven by the use of nitric acid which has never been used, uh, very, very, has very light usage in the, in the mining business. And we've uh, picked it up in uh, the chemical engineering sector of the United States, uh, some precursor technology, and migrated it into the development of our process. In August last year, we had our, um, not 2011, uh, August last year, we had our, a, a very exciting um, a demonstration of the process. We're now building a test plant in Perth. In chunky numbers, here is the uh, proposition presented by the direct nickel process. You can see that a typical PAL or ferronickel project will cost you between 25 to 35. Uh, I think the last unofficial figure I had on Connie Ambo was a $6 billion project there now. Uh, crazy big projects. We can do the capex at $12.50. These are independent figures, of course. Um, and looking over at the opex, um, Minara would be up at the $5.50, uh, Q&I would be on $7.50, and we're at $1.80. Obviously a great revolution in cost. Uh, the other great uh, unique thing about it is that uh, the direct nickel process is the first universal process. So you know we've heard about limonites and saprolites, and they have to be processed separately. Here you can see from this diagram we have the first process that will take the whole profile with one flow sheet. We produce a high quality hematite, we produce a high quality magnesium oxide which is a valuable neutraliser and we produce nickel cobalt MHP, mixed hydroxide product. In all of our costings we attribute zero, zero um, earnings to iron, magnesium and cobalt. So we don't, there's a We've got our bullshit detectors out and we're not trying to fool ourselves on the uh, co-product value. Um, better known for this project, Anglo, is, uh, we saw earlier, is a, um, is a shareholder in the Nautilus Minerals Company. I acknowledge the uh, uh, 
uh, Chairman of uh, Nautilus Minerals, uh, Jeff Loudon, here today. And uh, this, this is an um, illustration of our experience in, um, in, in taking on revolutionary uh, uh, projects. The, it, Nautilus has been given its environmental clearances and has its uh, mining licence and is ready to go. You'll notice tech is now represented on the share register of Direct Nickel, and that's the sort of signature thing for us. We have high quality partners. We like them as shareholders, and you can see Oz and the CSIRO is actually a shareholder investor of ours as well. Um, so we, we, we really work very hard on independent uh, quality verification of all of our work. So we give people room to be sceptical about it, the new things that we do. It's perfectly natural for anyone to look at the new with a, with a, in fact, I mean, it's the only reason that I lived as long as I have because I'm sceptic about, I was sceptical about some of the decisions I was going to make in the past. Scepticism is healthy and we have a very uh, well-developed procedure for um, involving people and taking them through the process of becoming convinced. Um, it's been a, um, we've had a, um, a lot of integration of the technical teams. Tech has a very good hydrometallurgical capability. That team is integrated with our team, is integrated with the CSIRO. So just prima facie, um, I think that those sort of associations and, and way of building a company is a lot that you can hang your hat on in, in accepting the figures given to you uh, earlier. The, uh, the, the existing processes are niche. I guess that's what I want to say to you from this slide. Um, they've all had their massive challenges, including capital cost. They have been, we've seen carnage out there in the, uh, in the pressure acid leach business. Some people seem to be getting it right, but essentially the capital markets are on strike for nickel laterite uh, projects, or have been. Uh, and yet the irony is that we have 120 years of supply in we're over-discovered in nickel laterite. It's sitting there. And we believe we have the key. If our process had been invented first, we never would have had those other four processes. Very briefly, and, uh, a little, and with, a, with a suitable amount of blurriness, uh, I'd like to uh, take us very quickly through the flow sheet. We dissolve uh, we, the uh, leaching process. Uh, we uh, introduce nitric to the um, coarsely ground laterite. Uh, Residence time, two to four hours, no pressure. Hey, I mean, the vessels are 304 stainless steel. This is not titanium, unobtainium with $100,000 valves. This is just basic um, tank farm chemistry. Take off the solids, uh, precipitate iron as hematite. We can control alumina according to uh, customer requirements for the MHP. Some people want it, some don't. The next thing we're dropping out is nickel cobalt as a mixed hydroxide. We dry it, bag it, and um, then the most critical part is and patented, IP protected, and uh, there's a lot of secrets and know-how is in getting from the bottom right-hand corner there back up to the top left-hand corner with our recycled process. I mean, nitric in its own right would be unusable if it wasn't recycled. You would also could imagine that you'd end up with enough uh, brown gas to cover Sydney. Um, so it is, we, we actually have a, the stunning and the most efficient aspect of this process is the way we, re, we regenerate the, the nitric. Uh, this is the green mixed hydroxide. Um, we can also, and it, it runs, um, those nickel numbers are actually uh, low. We, it does get up to 45%. I must correct that. So it's a quite a high value con, con that you can send anywhere. Here um, we also can just crash out, uh, do a precipitate, precipitate the, the iron with the um, nickel and do a, a feed for a ferro-nickel plant. A bit self-defeating really because we've got such a good process for making uh, mixed hydroxide. So a dream list of features. We recycle the reagent. Um, the, uh, it's, a, it's a tank leach uh, with very high recoveries, two to four hours. We've been down to one hour in a Brazilian deposit, which is a very exciting result for us. Uh, the operating intensity, as you imagine, when you're constructing, it's all welding rod construction. 
and uh, and then without the pressure you don't have that, that you know I don't know if you've been through a power plant but it's a bit like operating a, a nuclear plant, plant because you've got this sort of charge build up and you have to have all the safety procedures for winding that down as well very quickly sometimes under crash circumstances um, low capital cost and, and and operating costs uh, wonderful that's the the driver um, we can go from a really small plant of just 5,000 tonnes per annum. We're not, we don't have that big clunky steps that you have to go through with um, pressure acid leach, uh, nor the uh, capital intensity. You know, you, we, we know nickel laterite projects, you start with a billion dollars and, um, and it gets worse every year. That's the basic story, isn't it? You, uh, and as I say, I heard Connie Ambo was just short of um, uh, six billion when it was uh, targeting four. So, we can start from a little project and grow it up organically. Um, the LME, the, the mixed hydroxide product, we get paid 75% uh, of the nickel value. We're ideally situated geographically between China, the big market, and, uh, and the, all of the laterite um, nations of Southeast Asia. Uh, we also have, we're looking at Brazil, but uh, Given the um, abundance in Southeast Asia, it's probably a, it's a long airplane flight, and um, we might get there a little later on. We, we are engaged at the moment. We're negotiating with various deposits, and we have our first project in, in PNG. Now, given, given the failures of all of these other processes, we have here a perfect storm to be releasing a new technology into. We can. Um, we, we're very uh, cognizant that there is some, you know, there's a lot of um, financial wounds out there from the, the, the pressure acid leach process, um, which is, uses sulfuric acid. Sulfuric is a lazy reagent, and we simply uh, go through the process of getting people to jump into a, an appreciation of how powerful nitric is and uh, what a difference it can make in, uh, to, 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 through the are not needing uh, pressure. Um, thank you. The, um, we have right now a Perth test plant under construction. We're uh, doing a reverse takeover of a shell. We're just putting that through receivership, and uh, we will be have the, we're on the route to a $15 million uh, placement in tandem with that reverse takeover. Uh, the funds will go to completing the um, test plant under construction in Perth, and we'll be treating 150 tonne parcels of ore from um, uh, various partner um, deposits which we're currently um, uh, working on. So we are drilling our own. We've got our first project in Papua New Guinea. It was pitted by Anaconda, potential for 5 million tonnes of nickel contained, and we're drilling there right now. So we are a nickel company. Our business, we're, we're, that's our business model and licences will only go to projects in which we have a, a joint venture interest. As I said, here we are looking in Brazil, and um, for our uh, outcomes we're going to get the sort of um, outcomes that we, you would need for a feasibility study or a pre-feasibility study for, the, for any project. And we expect that, that to be up and running and first, one, first run completed in, in um, Q... In, um, in Q1 2011. So, Julian, just con conscious of time, we might need to yeah. wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Great. Excellent. Um, yeah, so there is a please talk to us about the investment opportunities, or if you have a ladder right deposit or you know someone who does, and uh, uh, look forward to seeing us on the um, Australian Stock Exchange in the coming months. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Our next speaker this afternoon is Bianca Manzi, GM Exploration at IMX Resources. Bianca has kindly agreed to step in for Duncan McBain, uh, I think, yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. yep. That's okay. okay. Thanks for that. Um, so here we go. There we go, start with the usual disclaimers. Um, there will be forward-looking statements, of course, and uh, in terms of all the competent person consents their mind, so it should be fine. You can't hear me? Is that, 
Okay, sorry. All right. So IMX Resources is a, an iron ore producer. We have a mine in South Australia, which is uh, Cairnhill. We own 51% of that mine, and we have the aim to go into a mid-tier miner with uh, multiple operations. The acronym IMX, of course, stands for Investment Mining and Exploration, as shown. We have uh, eight exploration projects uh, around the world, and um, predominantly the iron ore and copper gold exploration projects are in Australia. Two joint ventures are within that. Uh, one's in, with uh, Oz Minerals, um, covering the copper gold on our Mount Woods tenements, where we solely explore for iron ore ourselves. <clears throat> so just a quick look at the uh, corporate structure. We have about 262 million shares on issue, and uh, with, with the current share price, we're at about 130 million market cap. And we have no debt, so we're doing pretty well with a, a, a healthy cash balance. Okay, that's Can Hill. Uh, it's currently in operation in just about 55 kilometres south of uh, Kubapiti. So you can see the pit there, and just uh, just above that, you can see uh, the outline of the second pit uh, bund, which we haven't quite got to just yet. It's pretty green out there at the moment, uh, a lot of rain, which has led to quite a bit of uh, delays in drilling programs in recent times, but I'm sure everyone's uh, suffered from the same thing. So there, there it is again, um, just showing that the project itself in red there is the Mount Woods uh, tenements, that's the exploration licences, and Can Hill's uh, dead centre of the, the biggest licence we have. It's, uh, the uh, actual mine site is 14 kilometres from the Stewart Highway, so we're pretty fortunate to have uh, really good access. And uh, we've built an underpass under the Stewart Highway, of course, which we then haul from the mine site 60-odd kilometres across to the rail siding. And then we uh, rail the, the ore down to uh, Port Adelaide at this, port, at this point. Uh, we would like to go to Port Benython, as many would. Um, but uh, Port Adelaide is our option for the moment. We uh, are strongly in support of keeping our workforce in Cooper PD. At the moment, we only have 25% of our staff there, but uh, we aim to, to get, bring it up to 50%. So iron ore is our, our prime focus, as well as uh, copper and nickel. But in, in the Mount Woods area in particular, we've decided to focus on the iron ore and um, joint venture out the copper gold to Oz Minerals. So we refer to Can Hill in two phases. At the moment, we are mining phase one, which is magnetite, copper and gold. And it's a small operation. Um, it's only 1.7 million tonnes per year, but it's a DSO magnetite. So all the ore is being processed for the copper and gold in China by our customer, who is Sichuan Taifeng, and they have a life of mine sales contract with us. So it's all sold and it's, uh, yeah, good for us. <laughs> and then we have... Uh, Phase two of uh, Can Hill, which we're currently working on the resource, and we've finished the uh, the drilling in uh, the last month or so, and uh, that's underway to get to calculate the new resource. We're trying to fast track uh, phase two because, of course, the phase one area has a five-year mine life. So the sooner we can bring into production the second phase of our iron ore, um, the better it is for us and our shareholders, of course. So we're trying to bring that up to about 0.8 to 1.2 million tonnes per annum by next year. And the third string in our bow in our iron is uh, snaefell, which is a different type of uh, iron deposit. It's actually more a classical uh, magnetite, uh, finer grain magnetite hosted in a nice rather than being a massive magnetite. And it, uh, we, we've just recently completed that program as well to aim for our starter, you know, 75 to 100 million tonne resource, uh, and that should come out at the end of the quarter also. MET work is underway as well, and uh, with the aim, aim of getting that one into production within three to five years as well as a five million tonne per annum operation, it will need its own separate infrastructure from Can Hill, of course, because it's a different type of ore. So looking back at um, Can Hill itself, it, it is in production. We are just about to ship our fifth uh, load. It's, uh, as far as I'm aware, the, the boat's just off uh, Port Adelaide at the moment. 
Uh, we got just commissioned the second train set, so we should be at full capacity by the end of this month. And uh, so, as I was saying before, Canhill is a, a massive magnetite. It's actually direct ship because it's so coarse grain and easy to upgrade. It's 71% you know, iron uh, magnetite concentrate at 150 microns, which is not like every other magnetite, which is why we can do what we do. The, uh, and the copper and gold adds, uh, well, the copper in particular adds about a third to the, the revenue stream. Uh, one of Duncan's favourite slides, just showing how coarse Can Hill is to produce such a high grade, uh, um, <coughs> a high grade uh, concentrate as opposed to uh, other magnetite deposits. Some photos of the mine um, are from various times, and just uh, you can see the iron ore down in the, the bottom corner, a bit of water too, but luckily we were doing some cutback on the top of the, uh, um, the other pit at the time. <coughs> So we have a mobile crushing unit, and that pretty much moves around the stockpile, so that's quite, quite simple. And we, we uh, hog train the, the ore across to uh, the rail siding in these side tippers, and on the bottom photo you can see that it's, uh, they don't actually stop, they just tip it out and keep going. Then they get loaded onto the uh, trains, which, are, with our, which have our custom-built uh, containers, which carry about 34 tonnes each, and they go all the way down to Port Adelaide, which, there we go, to our hard stand, and um, outlined there in red, and you can see in the, in, over in the yellow there that uh, they all stack pretty much in, uh, on the hard stand until they're ready to uh, be sent off or loaded into the ship. And uh, it's basically that's our storage shed, so it's it's very good from an environmental perspective and a money perspective, obviously. So the retainer system that we're using uh, picks up the containers and lowers them into the hold of the ship, and has some sprayers that keeps all the dust down. So it's it's been pretty good for to, um, especially being um, in Port Adelaide. And this is Biochen, the processing plant that our um, offtake partners have uh, built specifically for our ore in China. It was commissioned as of last week. So, um, yeah, things are finally moving along there. The winter didn't get the better of them. And just coming back to see where Canhill Phase 2 um, actually is, it's immediately east of the actual Phase 1 pit. So um, mining it should be fairly easy, but we're working on our target resource of 8 to 12 million tonnes at uh, 45 to 50% iron, and uh, hopefully we'll have that resource out in, in by the end of the next quarter, or this quarter, sorry. So metallurgically, the phase two is, um, is identical to phase one, except it doesn't have uh, copper and gold. So it makes it a little bit simpler. It's, um, it's pretty much just a, another DSO type ore, and uh, we can produce uh, you know, quite, a, quite a good grade 68% uh, magnetite concentrate uh, at you know, a coarse grind, just like the other one. And um, if we wanted to bring it up to 70%, we, we just needed to do a finer grind. It's that our preferred option is to actually do the intermediate option and you know, get it to about a 60% iron grade on site. And then um, you know, just that would be, take a lot less time in the approvals process. So we're trying to fast track that to get that happening. Snaefell uh, is 12 k's southwest of, uh, of the Cairn Hill operation. As I said, it's a different style of magnetite. Um, importantly, it's, it can produce about a 68% or should, sorry, should be 66% concentrate at about 180 microns. But uh, the most important part is about 40% of it can go to the ROM uh, to remove uh, the, uh, the ROM material so that uh, you know, after crushing, most of, it's mostly all once it goes through the, the mag separator. And uh, yeah, as I said, with three to five years, we're trying to get that happening. Okay, um, a couple of other uh, magnetite prospects we have within our our licences. Um, just shown there, there's uh, we have target tonnages and exploration uh, ongoing in those areas, but they they're yet to be followed up. Uh, the exploration licences are 100% iron is ours, and they're under joint venture with Oz Minerals for all the copper, gold, and everything else. Sorry, 
And um, if you're interested in all the details of the uh, joint venture, we can give them to you at any time. Um, but it's, you know, it's been a good deal for us, and uh, getting access to their data helps us explore our data, um, our area as well for iron. And um, at the moment, they're drilling, and there's no um, end in sight really for the drilling. They're planning to just keep drilling until they uh, have tested all their targets, which they're generating on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Our next speaker this afternoon is Stuart Matthews, Chief, Chief Operating Officer, Kimberley Metal. Okay, I'm going to take you through the Kimberley Metal story. We are a silver and base metals company. We're on target for production in New South Wales from our Mineral Hill project. Only a matter of weeks away now. <coughs> and uh, we uh, have commenced advanced feasibility work on our Sorby Hills project up near Kununurra. I'll just touch on that one briefly, but I'm focusing on our production efforts at the moment. Our usual disclaimer. Uh, our capital structure, you can see the shares issued there. We have a market cap of about 65 million. Not quite that good on today's share price. But we do have $12 million in cash in the bank as I speak today. Uh, so that's a pretty healthy position heading into production. Our key assets, Mineral Hill, we have an existing processing facility which was a bit tired but we have fully refurbished this plant. It's 95 per cent complete now, up to 250,000 tonne per annum capability. We have full electrical office and um, mechanical infrastructure in place, as well as the underground development at the mine. Uh, we're on existing mining leases. We have copper, silver, gold, lead and zinc resources of high quality. The other key asset, Sorby Hills. We have mining leases there as well. They've just been renewed for 21 years as of February last year. Uh, we have uh, great nearby infrastructure, only 50 kilometres from Kununurra. It's, uh, we believe it's the largest silver lead zinc project in Australia today that's undeveloped at open cuttable depths. We have mineralisation that starts as shallow as 10 metres from surface and we're looking at a project that will uh, mine uh, open cuts down to about 70 metres deep and maybe give us a mine life in excess of 10 years. Interestingly, just on Sorby, I'll touch a little bit that um, on the 12th of uh, May, Meridian on the Lennon Shelf we'll have a project which is very similar to ours and very similar in size but uh, it's a deep underground project. There was a heads of agreement um, deal announced between Northwest Non-Ferris which is a Chinese group and Meridian to purchase that project for $78 million. Based on our resource which is shallow and open cuttable that would value Sorby Hills as a sale at $70 million, although I would suggest it's uh, worth a lot more because it's so shallow and very high quality grade. Um, Kimberley Assets, that's uh, a summary resource table. There's more details um, on the announcement that was made to the Stock Exchange today. Uh, the resources do contain, 40, our resources contain 44 million ounces of silver, 62,000 ounces of gold, 1 million tonnes of lead, 200,000 tonnes of zinc, 30,000 tonnes of copper. Now I'm not claiming that all of these resources will become reserves, but a 70% conversion, which is uh, I think realistic with what we have on our books, that equates to about $3.2 billion of metal in the ground. Uh, the main thing I draw your attention to on this table is the Parkers Hill sulphide ore body there of 1.3 million tonnes, 35 grams of silver, 1.9% copper and just over a percent of lead and zinc. That is what we're targeting in the next couple of months where our first production will come from, from underground. So production is pending at Mineral Hill from the Parkers Hill copper part of the ore zone. All our key management positions are in place. We have a general manager, we have a processing manager, a mining manager and mine geologists are just hitting the deck now. We're recruiting all our operations personnel to get into production. 
our strategy. We have um, Parker's Hill Underground. We're fully permitted to go. We'll be producing copper concentrate with silver and gold credits. Following that, we'll have we're putting flexibility into our processing plant, which will produce silver and a lead zinc bulk concentrate. That gives us about a five to six year mining operation. Concurrent with that, during the production phase, we will be developing the Pierce Open Cut. That is in the permitting and regulatory stage now. Uh, we'll produce gold dore from the oxide and then uh, concentrate later on. Two years of mining, three years of processing. And we have great regional targets to go beyond that and in mine as well. So we're looking at about 4,000 tonnes of copper in the next uh, 12 to 14 months. Following on from that, we will have the capability in our processing plant to generate a copper concentrate as well as a bulk lead zinc concentrate. And from the PS project, 20,000 ounces of gold and 150,000 ounces of silver. We wouldn't usually develop that if you didn't have a processing plant. We have one. So Parker's Hill, we have an underground contractor mobilised. We're in final contract negotiation. Our decline's 100% rehabbed. Our initial 12 months of production is defined and reserves are in progress and an announcement is pending very shortly to the market. We have taken our first shot in anger only a couple of uh, weeks ago on the 6th of May. We have a dual purpose development going on there, a new ventilation access for Parker's Hall as well as our new ore drives which will drive our initial production. Our first development ore is only a matter of two or three weeks away and uh, all from production stopes we expect to have end of August, although I just heard that uh, that may be moved by a month earlier. We have a mine plan. All the development you see in grey here was paid for by somebody else. It wasn't us, it was Triaco in the old days. Thanks. Very thankful for that. They have three accesses into the high-grade copper part of this resource. We're developing the blue development to get to the top of that resource. And that's the plan, shows the same thing. We have got 980 metres of development planned. 80% of that development will be in ore. Our operating costs, you can see we're pretty high initially. That just corresponds with um, commissioning our new and refurbished and modernised processing facility and we're developing high cost um, development ore and some capital development. But as soon as we hit our 700 tonne per day target from production stoping, contributing to that ore supply, we're down to $2.15 per pound of copper operating cost, which is pretty healthy margin. If you look at the unit costs per pound of copper, the biggest cost driver is the underground mining cost of about $1.14. Um, almost 60 cents for the on-site processing. Some minor numbers there for admin, safety, community expenses, and almost 30 cents for uh, smelting and refinery. So our, our controllable cash costs at site looking at $2.15. And our total costs are just around about 2.80. Just to take you through the refurbishment of the plant, you can see we've, spent, uh, we've got this existing flotation CIL circuit we spent 7.9 million in plant refurbishment and modifications that will achieve first production. The value of that asset today, to build it from scratch, would be $45 million. It is a strategic asset in the region that others uh, are quite welcome to come and talk to me about. Uh, we've completed the crusher area there, all looking new and modernised. Conveyors and screens and fine oil bins, all completed. Mills will be completed within the next seven days with new ring gear and all the bearings. All that alignment is happening right now as I'm speaking. Our flotation area, all cells have been rebuilt and are installed. We just have electrics and plumbing to complete. Uh, the Pierce Gold project has proven a probable reserves. Just a reminder where that's at, it's in the permitting and approval process right now. It's, it's actually in its public display period with the Lachlan Shire Council. So just in summary, Kimberley Metals 
We are a silver and base metals company and we're poised for production. That's the main message I want to get through to everyone today. We're only a matter of six to eight weeks from commissioning our processing plant. We will have cash flow from Mineral Hill mid this year. And we have started feasibility works at our Sorby Hills project, and I can talk to you, to you more about that at our stall. And we have quality and value of assets to become a uh, producer and go beyond that. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Stuart. Our final presenter for this session is Andrew Woskett, Managing Director of Minotaur Exploration. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This afternoon, I could, uh, to profile Minotaur for you, I could tell you all about our very exciting copper gold projects, particularly in the Cloncurry region of Queensland, where we have a very extensive ground position. I could also talk about our copper gold projects on the York Peninsula and south of Olympic Dam. Alternatively, I could talk to you about uh, our world-class China clay project out near Sejuna. But I'm not going to do any of that. However, if you are interested, all of the board of uh, Minotaur is here, except for one director who's overseas. And we have a booth. We'd be happy to take you through the detail of all of that stuff. But today, I want to talk to you about something that's happening very close to Broken Hill, because that's where we are, and I thought it was relevant. And I want to talk about the Braemar Iron Formation. Now, you might have heard me mention this yesterday morning, and others, particularly Carpinteria and Havilar, have mentioned it too. But I do want to spend a little bit of time, at the risk of banging on about it, I want to talk about it because it is, uh, it is quite significant, both in the context of this town, the region, and what we are doing. So I'll briefly go through the Braemar Iron Formation. I want to tell you about why I think the Braemar and why we collectively think the Braemar is uh, the next big thing in iron ore in Australia, and that's why we've fundamentally formed the Braemar Iron Alliance. And then I want to talk to you about what we at Minotaur are doing about that in our, in our sense. So the Braemar Iron Formation, which runs from just outside of Broken Hill, all the way down to Peterborough in South Australia, a distance of 250 kilometres, is a very extensive system. No question about that. It runs north and south, on north, south and south, speak your pardon, north side and south side of the railway line. You can see it on this uh, total magnetic image as the red pieces, the red bits. So at that scale, it's even quite obvious, which underscores just how extensive it is a big system. There are very significant magnetite deposits along that Braemar. That has, been, that has been proven and you have heard some more about that from the likes of Carpinteria. So like Nick Sheard, who's very excited about the prospects, so are we. And there are a number of parties who are also excited, quite apart from Minotaur and, and Carpinteria and Havilar. It's a very active area. There's six or eight different companies working there. You can see them uh, spread around on this, uh, on this map. And uh, all of them are in uh, exploration guise and working towards resources and uh, feasibility studies. So why do we say the Braemar is such a hot area? What is the scope of it? It's, it's, under, it's simply because of the scale of it. Big, big tonnages. And I just, uh, in respect of the disclaimer on that previous slide, we're not talking about jork resources here. These are projections, guesstimates at best. But the, the, the general view amongst the uh, members of the Braemar Iron Alliance is that there will be 20 to 40 billion tonnes of material defined over the next several years through exploration. And that is, that is uh, a fairly sizable uh, quantity for iron in the ground. But in terms of what we want to describe today, let's be somewhat conservative and let's assume that only 50% of that shows up. Even so, that's 20 billion tonnes of potential, potentially mineable material that could be yet defined. But if there was 20 billion tonnes, let's say there was five pits mining 50 million tonnes of ore each per year, and each of those was beneficiating up to 10 million tonnes per year of concentrate, then that's 
that's an annual output of 50 million tonnes of concentrate. So that's the sort of target that collectively we're working towards. If there was 20 billion tonnes of, of uh, ore and we were mining 250 million tonnes collectively per year, that equates to a life of mining scenario of about 150 years. So that number alone, I think, illustrates for you just the size, the scale and the potential for this region. But most importantly, we're pretty certain from the work that has been done by a number of us that the quality of the concentrate is very high. We've just heard about the magnetite deposit at IMX, very impressive, very high quality concentrate. This will be very similar. So just turning to uh, what um, um, Minotaur Exploration is doing on the Braemar, we have a project based around the uh, Minotaur um, homestead on Minotaur Station, sorry, Minotaur Station. And our activity there is a joint venture with Sumitomo Metal Mining Corporation. We're very, very pleased to have a partner like Sumitomo. They are a first class joint venture partner, very reliable, very solid. And I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, Mr. Yugimoto from Sumitomo is here with us today. We're very pleased to have him. So it's a very solid relationship and it's working very well. And the joint venture partners together this year have decided to hit it hard. We have a budget this year for $6 million and we're spending that money right now. So what we have done in the last year or so, at, at, in fact since this time last year, is to define on our tenement, EL3745, define over 40 kilometres of strike of the uh, Braemar ironstones. We've done that by flying 3,500 line kilometres of low level uh, detailed helimag. And we found that the mineralisation is, is either outcropping or subcropping very close to the surface, very little cover at all. The first two drill holes we poked in at Duffields on the bottom left side there showed us that the, the sedimentary units were nice and wide, over 200 metres, and most importantly produced very high quality concentrate at a very coarse grind size. So that was very encouraging and that allowed the joint venture to uh, press forward this year. So this year already we have uh, done quite a bit of work. We've defined a 10 kilometre long high strength anomaly at uh, a place we call Muster, which is shown on the graphic there. And Muster is uh, a very high intensity magnetic uh, uh, target. We've drilled seven holes. We've established that the sedimentary beds are generally about 750 metres wide, with the most highly enriched section being about 300 metres in the centre in true thickness. As I said, very close to surface, if not outcropping. We've drilled to 200 metres depth, and the geophysics that we have done, based on all of the geomodelling and uh, drilling, tells us that this system is very, very deep, extremely deep. Most importantly, the concentrate grades are consistent with what we found on the other deposit, and we're getting very nice quality concentrates, and in particular those concentrates are very low on impurities. In fact, they're almost absent. So what we've been able to do with, as a consequence of all of that work is to define an exploration target. And that's come out of the sterling work that our team has done, ably led by Tony Belperio and managed effectively by Ian Garsid. Very good quality work. This is an example of the sort of interpretation we've done uh, what I like about this graphic is that it shows the horizontal plane at 250 metres below surface, which is the depth that we've taken our uh, estimate uh, for exploration size to, 250 metres below surface. You can see from this image, this system goes down a lot, lot deeper than that. As I said, the central section there, the bright red part, represents the most highly enriched uh, zone across the uh, package of sediments. 300 metres wide, a nice mining width, and that has allowed us to generate an exploration target of 2.4 to 4 billion tonnes. Most importantly, as I said before, the quality of the concentrates is exceptional. We don't need to worry about the details here, but if you look at all of the criteria that, sat, that you need to satisfy for blast furnace grade feed, 
the magnetites from this area satisfy every one of those criteria. So more importantly, what are we doing now? For, during the course of this year, we've got 15,000 metres of drilling underway, both RC and Diamond. We have a very, very large rig out on site, drilling uh, 300 metre deep holes with RC. And that work will continue on for the next two or three months and will will be fed into a, a resource model. At the same time, we'll be doing the necessary metallurgical test work that you need to characterise the... Uh, the magnetite, and that'll all feed into a scoping study. So by the end of this year, we'll have a scoping study on the size, the potential size of a project on this uh, particular uh, package of, um, of complexes. The exploration target that we publicised yesterday is the foundation for that, and it's a very good platform to move forward. So we are well positioned on the Bramar, and I think you need to watch this space. Thank you.